I was fortunate enough to be invited to an event to play Pokemon Pocket early. I think I've played this game probably more than anyone out there outside of a dev. I literally played it from the moment they let me until they shut the thing down. So I'm going to try to go over every single thing I know about this game with all of you right now. I will have timestamps on the video in case there's a specific feature you are interested in. Jake, your resident content cowboy here. Yeehaw, and let's talk Pokemon trading card game Pocket. First, let me hit you with the basics. Pokemon Trading Card Game Pocket releases globally on October 30th with a soft launch sometime soonish, we don't know, in New Zealand. The app is being developed by DNA and all of the cards by Creatures. The game is free to play with in-app purchases that of course, like any mobile game, they absolutely want you to make. And the core focus of this game is on collecting. However, there is a pretty decent battle system inside the game that I was impressed by. I'll talk to you more about battling later. Some quick details about the event I attended. It was live here in Los Angeles. They gave us a presentation about the game and then they gave us some phones where we could actually play the game with all of its features for about four or five hours. After this, they also let us sit down and ask questions directly to the developers of the game, which had some very interesting answers and a lot of things that I found, I don't know, I guess very, um, positive. I walked away with a lot of uh, excitement and honestly, I think Pocket's gonna be really cool. For those interested, I believe they gave us a Samsung S22 phone. That's the device we were playing on and everything ran great. It was really, really smooth. I don't know exactly how many years old that is, but I think it's like a couple years old and the game ran really, really well. So let's get into the bulk of this game, which is collecting cards and opening packs. You are able to open two packs a day. They are on 12 hour timers. Once you have two packs stored up, the timer will not continue to count. However, if you've opened one pack, you will continue to sort of generate another pack every 12 hours. Using their premium subscription, which is $9.99 a month here in the United States, that will give you an additional pack a day. I'll talk to you more about premium currency a little later. Not only will you open two packs a day, especially when you start the game and start progressing your character level, you will unlock these things called hourglasses. These hourglasses will reduce the time it takes to open a pack by one hour. And at the start, you generate these very, very quickly. You will open a lot of packs early in the game, at least if they keep to what they had in this demo, which I assume they will. At the start of the game, you'll be generating a lot of hourglasses as you go through the events and the missions and the tutorials where you can open a lot of packs. I guess a lot of packs is subjective, but again, they throw a lot at you early in this game. You can open one pack at a time or 10 packs at a time. To open 10 packs at a time, you would need a ton of hourglasses or you would need to purchase the premium currency. They actually do this cool little thing. When you open 10 packs at once, you kind of rip them all and you see all the packs open up. And if you have a very rare card in there, you'll see stars sort of fly out as you go down the line of packs. It's a really cool animation. I don't have it to show you, but I thought it was really awesome. The first expansion for TCG Pocket is Genetic Apex. Genetic Apex has three booster packs, a Pikachu, a Charizard, and a Mewtwo. And each one of these packs does have some pack specific cards inside of it. Obviously you've seen the Full Art EX Pikachu and the Full Art EX Mewtwo. There are other Full Art cards that you will find. Do the math there. Each booster pack has five cards inside of it. However, that may change in future expansions. Obviously, they have their eye on bringing more expansions to the game. I got to talk to the devs a little bit about that, and I'll tell you what they told me a little later. But for now, it's five cards inside of Genetic Apex when you're opening each little pack. The card rarity system is from one to four diamonds, as well as from one to three stars. Three stars being that full art that you go into, and each rarity having kind of more going on with the cards. The one diamond cards looking pretty basic, where the four diamond cards have unique hologram patterns and something they're calling a parallax effect, where when you move the card around, you can see different layers and textures of the card, and it sort of pops out of the frame. The stars on the cards indicate a full art card where you see the Pokemon in their individual habitats. And these are also incredible looking cards with holographic borders, parallax effects, a lot of cool stuff going on. And then of course, those three star cards as we talked about are fully immersive cards that take you in. And from what I saw at Worlds, when I opened the pack and got the Pikachu, it really is quite a treat. And what I saw here in this demo, with a few things I'm not allowed to talk about, I saw the the coolest version of that 
at the event. When you're collecting cards, you are filling up the Pokédex for that expansion, right? So you are able to start collecting cards for Genetic Apex and try to fill up your entire decks, moving all the way down to the most rare cards. Obviously, you're gonna wanna try to do that before you move on to the next expansion set when they release that. Collecting being such a huge part of this game, they want you to be able to show off your cards so you'll have custom binders that you can set up and sort of little display boards where you can put your coolest cards and show your friends. I think there will be a big aspect of, you know, sharing this with a friend as a daily event mission, which I'll talk more about. I believe they called the missions here in a bit. I'm sure a lot of you have questions about what happens when you have multiple versions of a card and trading. I'll talk about trading and something called wonder sharing here in a little bit. Let me first talk about having multiple cards. So if you are able to get multiple versions of a single card, which of course you are when you're opening packs, it's just completely RNG based and whatever you pull, you pull, you can use these cards and sort of grind them down into something they call shine dust. And you can use that to get card specific flair. So you can have flair that looks like little stars popping off of cards or little pokeballs. You have different ways of sort of using those extra cards to make your card collection look a little bit cooler. There also was a system for using cards to sort of unlock other cards you didn't have. I didn't get to explore that in insane amounts of depth and I can't really tell you exactly how many cards it would take to unlock the super rare Pikachu because all of that could change. But there is sort of a system in there to use the cards you already have, basically get rid of them, almost a crafting system, right? and use that to unlock some of the more rare cards. Again, I don't know what it will look like in the full release, but it looked like something where they went, hey, if at some point you really didn't get this, you know, Articuno that you're looking for, you're able to unlock it. I should mention also that there is no pity system that I saw in the game. So it's not like if you opened a hundred or a thousand of those Pikachu packs that eventually they will guarantee you that Pikachu. There may be something specific in the game that gives you that ability, but there's nothing that I saw that says there is any type of system like that. I think their version of it is that sort of crafting-ish system I talked about before. Let's talk a little bit about monetization in this game, what things cost, in-game currency, and a little bit more. So I talked briefly about how you can get different binders to showcase your cards. There are also other things that you can get to sort of personalize your account. You can have a personalized coin when you go into battle, personalized card sleeves, personalized play mats. So when it's your turn, the opponent will see what play mat you're playing on. They'll see your card sleeves and vice versa. You'll see whatever they have set up. And there seem to be multiple ways to unlock this. Some of these are in exclusively premium route and some of these are unlocked through gameplay. So again, there were multiple in-game currencies I saw. A shop ticket, an emblem ticket, a special shop ticket, an event shop ticket, and and then of course, premium currency that you buy. Basically, each section of the game had different ways for you to unlock things. The missions themselves have ways where you're unlocking hourglasses, where you're unlocking tickets and emblem tickets. All of this is essentially a way to unlock different customization in the game. It's not really to unlock cards at all. It's just unlocking ways to customize your account, to customize your background, your play mat, your cards, things like that. Then we have the Poke Gold currency and the premium pass. Sort of the information that we have up on the app stores for the games is very accurate to what I saw in this demo. So you are able to buy Poke Gold, five Poke Gold for 99 cents. Every one Poke Gold reduced the time to open a pack by two hours. So 99 cents didn't exactly open one pack. It got you very, very close. However, if you bought them in a bundle of for like 20 bucks, again, specific to my currency here in the United States for 20 bucks, it was enough to rip open 20 packs, maybe even a little bit more actually with like the little bonus they give you, right? But that was about the break even point for opening 20 packs of cards. Then they have the premium pass. It was 10 bucks a month and you would unlock an additional one pack every single day. So you weren't opening two, you were now opening three. At the same time, you also had premium missions that you would be able to play and then premium things that you 
you could unlock. So there was a premium deck back, there was a premium play mat, there was a premium coin. All of those things were specific to a premium pass, but there were also a ton of those things that you could unlock without a premium pass at all. There were also specific promo cards that you could unlock through the premium pass, but from what I saw and from what I was told, the cards are identical in stats and abilities to the cards that are in the game otherwise. So let's just say, I didn't see this, let's just say there was an EX Venusaur premium card. The EX Venusaur premium card and the one you would unlock just by opening packs would be exactly the same, just with different art. Some people are probably gonna wonder how much money they could spend on this game right away. And just like any game that has a premium currency, especially something where it's a premium currency to open essentially random packs of cards. I could imagine people dropping a lot of money on this game right away. It's not something you have to do, but if you're looking to obtain every card, especially every card very quickly, you are going to need to pay real money in this game. So let's talk about trading and let's talk about wonder picking. Wonder picking reminds me of wonder trading from the VGC line. It lets you select a card at random from a booster pack that someone else opened. It could be a friend from what it looked like, but it also could could just be some random person out there. It will show you the pack of five cards they opened and you will then pick a card at random. Picking that card will flip one of them over and you might be lucky enough to get the card you were looking for. There also were specific sort of event wonder picks that I saw. The one I remember seeing uh, most specifically was one where it was four Meowths and a Chansey. And if you pick a Meowth, the next time you open it, it's three Meowths and two Chanseys, et cetera, et cetera, until you finally pick that Chansey card and then you have completed that event. It lets you pick one card at random and it had what looked like a very similar timer to opening packs. It required a specific stamina gauge on it called Wonder Stamina and there were also Wonder Hour glasses to reduce this timer. This just felt like another way to sort of get a random bonus card. There also were Wonder Packs that sort of cycled through and reset after a set amount of time. You were able to use a function in the game called a rewind watch to sort of go back and try to pick from a pack that had already cycled through. I didn't spend a ton of time with this function because I was just busy opening insane amounts of packs and battling and stuff like that. Uh, but it looks like you'll be able to kind of have another bite. It's the apple basically of something that's moved on inside the wonder pick system. This just feels like a little bit of a lottery system that you kind of get to play. Uh, I think it looks like once or twice a day. Now, as far as trading is concerned, I got to talk to the devs a little bit about it, but the trading feature is not in the game at launch. At least it was not in the demo. Maybe it will be added into the soft launch. Maybe it will be tested out in these sort of soft launch and then put into the main game once it launches on October 30th. I do not know. I have a little information about trading. I'll, I'll just say it now when I talk to the devs, they are working on implementing that feature in a way that sort of makes sense. So it, I think the thought process was, and they didn't say this exactly, but it seemed like the thought process was, how do we make it so uh, a person who maybe has low information doesn't end up trading something valuable away to a person who is sort of looking for something like that, like, hey, I would love that Articuno and you need Sand Slash, don't you? So I'm wondering if there was some sort of thought process there. They didn't give any specifics about trading. It's a feature that they are implementing into the game very soon, but it was not in the demo we played. So I know a lot of you are probably excited to talk about battles. Let me talk to you about it. I played a ton of battles, battles against the computer, battles against other players, battles against other people that were there at the event. It was pretty easy to do. Let's get into it. There's a lot to say. So the decks are now 20 card decks, not 60 card decks like we have in the TCG currently. You can have three Pokemon on your bench and one active Pokemon in play. It's the first of three points that wins. Knocking out an opponent's Pokemon is one point. Knocking out an EX Pokemon is two points, and that's it. Three points, and you win the match. You don't have to keep track of damage, obviously. This is a digital card game. It keeps track of it for you. And you also don't have to worry about energy cards. 
there are no energy cards in your deck. Energy is automatically generated at the start of each turn, and you can place it on a Pokemon. You'll see a little indicator as to what energy you can place now and what energy is coming up next. If you have a multi-type deck, you'll see kind of what energy is on the horizon. I can't say this for sure, but it looked like it just went back and forth between the energy. So if you had, you know, a fire and a leaf deck, it looked like it was just going back and forth between fire and grass energy. On your turn, you can play a basic Pokemon anywhere on the board, and you can evolve a Pokemon if you didn't play it this very turn, or if you didn't evolve it this turn. So if you played Charizard last turn, excuse me, Charmander last turn, you could put it Charmeleon the next turn, but not Charizard right on top of that. One evolution per turn, and you can play as many as you want. You could fill up your bench right away, which would probably be a big mistake because you wouldn't be able to retreat. But again, that's what you can do on a turn. Play as many Pokemon as you want on your side of the board. On your turn you could also play supporter cards i believe you were able to play kind of one of each type of card per turn we didn't get super deep into it because we were still building all of our decks early on but you could play one of each type of card you can use an energy to pull your pokemon back and retreat actually the amount of energy depends on how evolved that pokemon is so like a basic pokemon costs one energy usually to retreat and then a charizard costs like four energy or something like that to retreat and then you usually ended your turn off by attacking the enemy Pokemon. Again, first to three points wins. The battles were really fast, really snappy with a decent amount of strategy inside them, but you could see it was very much focused on having a fast gameplay experience. Pokemon did have resistances and weaknesses, which leads me to believe that sometimes you're going to queue up and matchmake and you'll just run into a deck that absolutely dumpsters you. And that's just kind of how it goes. You also will play a lot of missions against the computer, which I'll talk to you about here in a sec. So as far as matchmaking is concerned, I talked to the devs a little bit about this and a little bit about their rank system. I'll get into some of this now. Right now, there's no ranked leaderboard that you're climbing inside the game. It's a matchmaking system that I would say from my conversation with the devs, seems like it's loosely based on some version of the uh, decks size you have, like how much of the decks you have completed, along with probably a variant of MMR somewhere in there. But of course, like any system that pairs players together, there isn't a ton of details on exactly how they do it. When trying to battle with a friend, it was pretty easy. You just can create a lobby. It has a custom code to it. You show the code to a friend, they input that code, and then boom, you're in a game right away. I did this a couple times at the event. It was very, very fun. I almost lost once, but I did get my Zapdos powered up and we were good to go. So it felt pretty good. Even though Zapdos has an ability where you flip coins to do damage and I was maybe the most unlucky person in the world. It came right down to the wire, but we were able to pull out a victory. Speaking of battling, there is battling against the computer. So there are multiple tutorial missions that you will go through teaching you how to battle in this game. As I said earlier, I think this is a really strong uh, system for new players. I, I, people are going to understand how to play this very well early on. The game also has functions for auto battle. So it will help you uh, put a deck together through auto making a deck and it will help you auto battle. So when you are obtaining cards, you can go in to look at your decks. They give you like a pre-made deck at first. Mine had, I think it was a bug type deck, if I remember. Like it was grass type and I had pincer and stuff like that in there. And after you start unlocking cards, you can just go into your collection, click on, I want to make a new deck and then say fire type. It'll show you all of your fire type cards that you'd like to put in there, right? And you could also say, just auto make me a fire deck, like make me the best fire deck I can. And it will give that to you. There are different missions that you're able to battle through and each one of them kind of like goes in a, a system that would make sense so you'll first go against sort of a water deck and it'll be squirtle and then the next level of its war turtle and then the next level of its blastoise so you need a better and better deck and the computer that you're playing against is better and better from beating these missions, there were multiple things that you unlocked, a lot of things giving you more player level, more hourglasses to open packs. There were event specific ones where 
I was battling against multiple Lapras decks, and through that, I was able to unlock different Lapras cards through that event. So there are a lot of battles against the computer that you're gonna be able to do, and these will help you complete a ton of your missions. So I talked a little bit about missions earlier. Missions, and there is a variety of these, give you lots of different unlocks in the game. The biggest thing they give you are hourglasses, which lets you open more packs, but there are also missions, if I'm remembering correctly, because we're not able to take any footage of the event, there were also missions that would help you unlock things like different uh, card backgrounds, different rental boxes, so you, earned enough of a certain type of Pokemon, like let's say grass Pokemon, and you got a rental pack of like, this is a cool Venusaur deck that we're gonna let you try out for a few days. So there are multiple missions that uh, give you the ability to unlock multiple things inside the game. Most of them are giving you the game's biggest free to play currency, which are hourglasses, which again, let you open more packs. However, a lot of these will give you the ability to unlock different you know, uh, ways to accessorize as your account, different collectibles, different play mats. There are premium missions that unlock those premium decks and premium play mats and things like that. So the game gives you a ton early on. In fact, I think my one complaint with the game is there were just a ton of different missions that you could take on. This isn't bad by any means because it will give players a lot to do and a, a lot to expand their collection right but at the same time it did feel a little cumbersome early on just to see how many different missions there were and how many different things you could do with if i unlock you know these specific fire pokemon i've completed a mission and if i do a certain amount of tutorial missions i've completed a mission like on and on and on so i think it's a good time for me to start talking about my conversation with the game's developers obviously pretty much everything i got to play and the things i got to experience in their presentation is about all they could tell me about it. But I had a lot of questions for them. I wanted to know about a ranked system in the game. I wanted to know about competitive play. I wanted to know about new series of cards coming. Uh, I wanted to know a lot and I got to ask them a lot of questions. And of course I got a lot of answers that were along the lines of stay tuned for more updates, but I can tell you some of the conversations we had and why I think there is uh, a lot to look forward to with TCG Pocket. So my first question was about competitive play, a ranked mode, things like that. The answer I got to, is there a ranked mode inside the game was there is not a ranked mode inside the game at launch. However, based on you know, player excitement and how much people want different features like that in the game, different features like that could be coming. I think what I would gather from it, and again, this is just me sort of feeling out the situation. I feel like they don't want to say, hey, this is gonna be at the world championships or something. And they don't wanna say it's competitive right off the bat. I think they want their printed version of TCG to be the thing at first. But I think there's no question that very much like Pokemon Go, they can easily start implementing this into the game if this is something players want. I think players are going to want it. So I think you're going to, I think they're gonna see a version of this come pretty soon for a ranked system in the game, something that you can climb, right? Uh, probably some sort of master rank rating or you achieve a, a certain rank per season, similar to a game I play a lot like Pokemon Unite. And I would not be shocked if you start seeing events for Pocket at the regional events that they have, you know, for all their other games. At first, it'll start off as side events, but then eventually could move to something bigger. I asked them a little bit about what they would expect the cadence to be for releasing new expansion packs. And they didn't wanna say exactly when they'd be coming, except that they are coming. There will be more expansions to this game. And there was a question as to whether or not a player playing fully free to play would be able to unlock every card in an expansion before a new one came out. And I think the overall vibe from that was, you will need to spend money if you're expecting to unlock every card in this game. Uh, I think a free to play player will have a very strong competitive deck, but I don't think you're going to see a free to play player unlocking all of the rarest stuff in the game. They're going to expect people 
would pay money to unlock all of the cards in this game, especially when we're talking about things like full art Pikachu and full art Mewtwo. There was some conversation with the devs as to the artwork in the game and if they would have more and different artists, if they would have sort of like very limited runs of cards printed by specific artists. And I could tell that they had a lot of ideas for how something like that could go, but they didn't have any specifics on that for the time being. The version that we are seeing has art that you've seen before, new art for this game. And I think they will need a lot. They even said they're, they're gonna need lots of artists to make all of the cards that they plan on putting in the game at some point, whenever they decide to release more cards. I should mention that there was an aspect of the game with a social function. It didn't have sort of groups or anything there yet. You had friends that you could add in the game. Uh, and I think this section of the game will start to grow as the game, you know, increases in popularity where you'll be able to have sort of little collecting clubs, maybe little clans or groups or however they would call it in the game. And you also should be able to share things with your friend in that section. It's pretty like, bare bones to start, but I was able to add friends and battle them through that section and also kind of like look at their profile. Most of my conversation with the devs was highly focused on the collectible aspect of the game. But of course there is that sort of undercurrent of what else could this be if we let this game continue to grow and if we see it grow in a specific direction. So if you're interested in a ranked mode, if you're interested in you know ways to have tournaments and stuff like this for this game, I think that is all very possible and definitely something that is on the horizon. Other things that are clearly on the horizon are more expansions for this game, expanded social features, events that are happening inside the game, whether they're through the wonder, sh uh, wonder pick area or they're, whether they're through battles, battling the CPU, timed exclusive events, things like that are definitely a big part of this game. And you'll see a lot of reasons to open pocket every day. Again, like I said, I played this game from the moment they let me until the moment they literally shut the entire thing down. A lot, almost everyone was gone at that point. There was still a decent amount of us like hanging out, getting every last ounce out of this game. I know I'm gonna be making a ton of content for it. I can't wait. If there's anything I missed or didn't clarify well enough, let me know in the comments. I'll try to release some specific videos about specific parts of the game and your comments could really help me figure out what I missed. So thank you all. I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I love you. I'll see y'all next time. Make sure you subscribe to this channel because I'm going to be making a ton of content for this game. All right. Bye. We did it. Oh boy, did we do it.